different kind of message that uh, we're given this morning. And I don't, I don't know whether you guys have noticed this or not, uh, but there's some kind of election coming up on Tuesday. I'm not sure, you know, it's, they tell me it's a pretty important one, too. In fact, they're saying that uh, this election may determine the direction of our country for the next several decades. That's a, that's a pretty important election, I would think. So has anybody found that when it comes to the election and when it comes to politics um, and who you're going to vote for, that maybe that's not necessarily a neutral topic that everybody sort of has an opinion on? Have you found that? Yeah. It's like a loaded emotional topic, isn't it? Anybody in here been in, and I know you have because I've, I've been around you, anybody in here been in an emotional, maybe a, even a heated conversation over this election yet? No discussions? No? <laughs> well, real quick, you know, I would try to do a little survey, and uh, I don't know if you remember when you, kid, when you were a kid, you had this all skate. All skate was when everybody got in the skating rink, even like your little brother, your little sister, and your mom and dad, you couldn't skate at all. All skate was for everybody. So this is sort of like all skate. Everybody gets to participate in this. Uh, any of you in here, I mean, be really honest, any of you enjoying all the drama and all the chaos in this election year? Anybody enjoying that? That's <laughs> true. Uh, how many of you can't wait for it to be over? Yeah, that's sort of what I thought. I, I have to tell you, I'm sort of in that group too. Uh, how many of you just just can't stand it? In fact, you might even use a hard word. You might even say, I just, I just hate all this tension that's associated. I, your hands are already being raised up, and I, I ain't even got the, uh, the question out. You know, politics comes up at the dinner table, and all of a sudden you want to leave the dinner table. Now, that's a real tense situation when I'm ready to leave a, uh, a, a dinner table. I have to tell you. How many of you maybe are like me? Uh, that at certain times, yeah, just bring it up yourself so you can sort of stir the pot. You know what I mean? Uh, I've done that. I've been to that. I've been to that. Okay. Right. Now, here's the most personal question. I, I promise I'm not going to get personal this, and I don't want you to yell out what you've done. Anybody like me that's already voted? Anybody here already voted? I just wanted to hear you. That's good. That's good. That's good. I, you know, I know I probably should have given this message a couple months ago. Uh, if you haven't voted yet, and again, first of all, let me tell you right up front, we are not, uh, we are not pushing any political candidate today. We are not uh, uh, talking about any political party today. Uh, that would be foolish. That would be wrong. But if you haven't voted yet, how many of you already made up your mind who you're going to vote for? I understand. There's a few people that still haven't made up their mind yet. So, so I, I look at that as a positive side. And you know, maybe some of you, and when I first heard this, you know, maybe some of you are like me and thinking, you know, churches and particularly pastors in general, we have no business talking about politics. You know, and why are we talking this? And yet you came anyway, you know? We, if you were here last week or you watched social media, you know, you're thinking, well, maybe I won't come because I know what they're going to be talking about, but just curiosity alone. You just couldn't keep away with it. But I, I really am glad that you came. And the reason I am, I said, after you hear the message, I think it's not going to be what you expect. And I think you're going to be glad that you came. And, and if you're here and you're not quite sure about this whole Jesus thing, I think you're going to be really glad that you came today as well. And I put all my cards on the table here. Uh, about five and a half years ago, maybe five years ago, uh, a pastor, a pastor that I follow, a pastor that I, I've mentioned uh, from time to time by the name of Andy Stanley, gave a message called avoiding the election infection right before the last, uh, the last election. Now, I didn't hear it, I didn't see it, uh, but about three years ago, a friend of mine, somebody who was on the lead team here, sent that message to me and asked me to listen to it. And it really, really, really impacted me. And uh, sometimes the message is so good, uh, you just can't get away from it. And as I did my research, what I found was a lot of people felt this message was so important that rather than preach it themselves, they just put the video of Andy Stanley preaching. But that's not always going to work for our church. What works in Atlanta, Georgia, to a congregation of 30 or 40 or 50,000 is 
not going to work in Shelbyville, Delaware with a congregation of about 25 or 30. So what we did is with their permission and even with their blessing is we sort of retooled this message for the people here at the Odyssey Church. So I want to be transparent and say it's not original, but, but it has been made into a little bit of originality by retooling it and making it appropriate for our church. And, and really, I think this message is more applicable today than it was when it was preached five years ago because this particular election year, this particular presidential election is much more controversial and more historic than any other presidential election probably in the history of the United States. It's been a very controversial um, election. There's been a lot of backbiting. There's been a lot of emotions tied to it. Uh, and there's a lot of history that's going to be made during this election. And based on the conversations that I've been part of, based on the conversations that I've overheard and some things in particular that I've seen on the news, what's going on in our town. I think the dynamics of this election make this message even more relevant today. So let me tell you right up front what my hope is. And, and this message is directed to Christians in particular. So if you're here and you're not a Christian yet, if you're just curious, if you're not sure that uh, Jesus is, is the person you should be following, you're still in the curious stage, you know, really, you don't have to do anything that's talked about today. But I think if you do, your life will be better either way. And if you consider yourself a Christian, you know, we're sort of commanded to do this. And so my hope today, if you're a Christian, is to help you live in such a way, even during this very emotional election period, that your words and your actions and your deeds will all match up together to glorify the one who has given us everything, to glorify God himself. That in the process, through this very difficult time, this high tension, this emotion, that in the process, that our words, our deeds, our actions match up in such a way that God is glorified. But honestly, it's so difficult to do in times like this because we all have an opinion. And we're all, we just get so emotional about it. And everybody has an opinion as to how and who should make the laws and who should run the country. And, and this is even more emotional charge when you, when you take it into account that this is just not any election. But this is a presidential election. And it's a historic presidential election. We have people running that, that in this country have never, the top two candidates have, have never truly been like what we have today. But people are divided in this election. So it makes it even more emotional. So how do we, how do we as Christians, how do we as Christians take this highly emotional area of our lives. Everywhere we have an opinion and our, our opinions are so diverse and so different, how can we make them become congruent with the actions of Jesus so that we glorify God in the process? How do we respond? I mean, some of you, I heard somebody mention Facebook. They're, I mean, how do you respond to these things that are being posted on your timeline? How do you respond when somebody says something to you that you know you absolutely disagree with? How do you respond to these things we're seeing in the news and on social media and in conversation? And the way I, I think I want to try to do this today is, is first of all, I'm going to try to present an idea in the way of a challenge first. I'm going to give you a challenge first. That's how I want to start out this one. I want to challenge, and I want to challenge all of you who call yourself a Christian. If you're a believer, if you're a follower, I'm going to challenge this morning. And, I, and you know, I have to be honest, I think you're up to it. Um, not every church that I've been at, not every church that I've been the pastor of may be up to it. But I think you guys are sort of special. I think you're up to the challenge this morning. And I'm not sure all Christians are, but I think you guys are. You're smart. You know, got an idea of what's going on. I've talked to you. You've got an idea of what's going on in this uh, uh, election. And, and I know all of you in here. And I know you personally. And I know you're super lovely. So, but, you know, we're up to the challenge. But if you're not a believer this morning, I kind of let you know, you know, this is really like the perfect Sunday to be here. This is like the perfect Sunday to be here and participating because 
just in a minute, we're going to be talking about a, a scripture that you already know. And, and it's a scripture that you've probably spoken in your life. And it's a scripture that you're going to agree with. It just not may not be a scripture that you know Jesus said first. And I know you're all going to agree with all this, even if you're not a Jesus fan. In fact, some of you, like I said, may have already heard it. You may have already said it. Just know, didn't know that Jesus said it first. So that's going to be sort of cool. Just to so there's a lot of common ground, but my challenge in it really isn't to everybody, even though everybody can participate. But this challenge is specifically to those who consider herself to be a Christian. And I want to challenge you to do is I want to challenge you between now and November 8th. So it's not a long challenge. Maybe, maybe Wednesday, November 9th, just, just to be safe. But I just want to challenge you to do one thing that's just for a couple days. I want to challenge you to put your faith before your politics. I want to challenge you to put your faith before your politics. In other words, in other words, I want you to take your faith filter and put it up front and then take your political filter and put it way near the bottom. Put your political filter first or put your political filter last and put your faith filter first. To be a Christ follower first and a Republican second. To be a Christian first and be a Democrat second. To be a disciple of Jesus first and a libertarian or independent second. Now, whatever your, your political views are, whatever your personal views are when it comes to politics, I'm going to ask you to bear down. I'm going to ask you to submit or, or would you place your political views, place your faith values as your Christian values first and your political values second. And this is actually what we're going to be talking about. We're not going to be talking about the election. We're going to talk about handle these situations which can be so emotional. So it's not really a political message, but it is at the same time a political message. But if you take these same principles and apply them to any area of your life, they will still work. Because let's face it, when you die, Nobody goes to Washington, D.C., do they? And when the resurrection comes, ain't nobody from Washington, D.C. going to come and get you. So for no other reason than that, we should put our faith first. Because our faith has to be somewhere other than politics, right? At some point, and here's the thing, because you're going to find this hard to do, and you're going to think to yourself, there is no way I can do this because I am so set in what I believe. When somebody comes to me with a different belief, I just have to let them know. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't. But I know we can do this. And here's how I know that we can do this. Because something could happen in your life that would make all your political views irrelevant inconsequential I mean nothing. You know, as a, as a pastor, I, I've had many, many opportunities to be at the bedside of people in the hospital, in the hospice, in their homes in a hospital. Bed. I've been with people that are going through divorce and bankruptcy and so many other things. And I know some of you have been with people that are going through very difficult times in your life. And not one single time did anybody ever say to me, Ron, could you please do me a favor? Could, could you please just comfort me by reading me a little bit of the Constitution of the United States of America? It don't happen. It don't happen. I mean, the Constitution is important, don't get me wrong, but when your child is sick, when you're on your deathbed, when you're facing a problem you don't know how to handle, it's not politics that's important at that point in time. It's your faith. What I'm doing is challenge you, just for a couple of days. I mean, just between now and, and Tuesday, maybe Wednesday to be safe, is to put your faith ahead of your politics. But, but please don't miss what I'm not saying. So, you know, sometimes when, when you hear this, some people just sort of tune out and they leave you before you're done. So, so please don't do that. Hear me out. I'm not saying 
do not have an opinion. Okay? I mean, you should have an opinion. I'm okay with that. I think it's important that we all have an opinion. And I'm not even suggesting that we should or we could all agree. I mean, that would be absolutely foolish, wouldn't it? We're never all going to agree. And I'm not suggesting that all Christians should vote for one particular candidate. I'm not suggesting that all Christians should lean into one party. That would be foolish as well. What I'm saying is that I'm challenging you simply to put your faith, your convictions, your Christianity, your faith ahead of your politics. Now, now some of you in here might be thinking to yourself, because as I heard this, I'm thinking, I am so glad I'm hearing this message, and I think I'm going to take it because those people over there really need to hear this message. But you know, I am got my faith filter set up. The reason I'm a member of this party is because of my faith. Are you kidding me? Of course my faith and my religion go together. That's why I left that party and became part of this party. It was because of my faith. In fact, really, I mean, everybody pretty much thinks we have this down, or at least most of us have, because we don't see any conflict between our faith and our politics. We don't see any conflict there. We're, we're like, this is why I'm part of this party. Because of my faith. My faith and my party are exactly congruent. They come together. It's those other people over there that need to hear this message this morning. I'm so glad we're talking about this. Because they need to hear it. And, you know, if you're a Republican, you're probably sitting there, of course I put my faith first. I mean, isn't God always right? Let the book of Proverbs say, the heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the foolish to the left. Of course I'm Republican. Because I lean to the right. It's those fools over there that lean to the left. They're the ones that aren't wise. I mean, it's right here over in the Bible. And Jesus was all right and right. So, of course, Jesus and God, they're Republicans. <laughs> you know? I lean to the right. And they're right. Everything goes right. And really, do we even need to talk about this? I'm right because of my faith. I'm a Republican. Everybody else, they're the sinners, man. So my faith and my politics, they match up perfectly. If you're a Democrat, you're sitting there going, are you kidding me? I mean, come on, Jesus, Jesus. I mean, what was Jesus all about? It was all about free food. It was all about free health care. He was about helping the poor. I mean, don't you read your Bibles? Remember that time he fed thousands and thousands of people that were hungry and they never even got a bill? Doesn't he just, just Jesus just teach us? Doesn't he teach us? In fact, he don't even he to ask. He commands us to take care of those in need, just like the Democrats do, you know? And what about health care? I mean, come on, Jesus. Jesus was a health care dispensing machine. Everywhere he went, he gave out free health care. Everywhere he went, he healed, he, he, he healed people for free. I mean, everywhere he went, people would line up to be healed. And, and they never got a bill. And they didn't even have to take a drug test. Jesus was all about free food and, and, and free health care. I mean, it was the heart of Jesus' ministry. It was all about that stuff. Plus, Jesus was just, you know, they're just like us, always getting on the case of the rich people. He even said rich people aren't going to heaven because they're going to put themselves in the eye or something like that. It's in the Bible somewhere. If you're a libertarian, you live, if you're a libertarian, you go, really? Really? You really believe that? I mean, come on. The, the most famous verse in the New Testament is John 3.16. But the second most famous verse in the Bible is one that every politician uses sooner or later. I mean, at some point or ever, every political candidate quotes the most politically correct verse in the entire Bible, and nobody but us libertarians get it right. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall... Amen. Free, free, right there, free, like in liberty. Libertarians are the only ones to get it right. And didn't Moses say, don't deviate? You don't deviate to the right, and you don't deviate to the left. 
I mean, Moses was a libertarian. <coughs> not to mention, not to mention there was this incident one time where Jesus was talking to this rich young ruler. And when he talked to the rich young ruler, he, he sort of sent the rich young ruler away. And the rich young ruler was sad. So obviously Jesus, you know, Jesus thinks about rules and he's not real fond of rules and rulers. And if then, if that wasn't enough, the apostle Paul, who was actually talking to Christians, I mean, Jesus wasn't even talking to Christians. The apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the, the people in Thessalonia, 1 Thessalonians, uh, he said this. He goes, how much clear can I? He said, work hard, work hard with your hands and mind your own business. I mean, we could pray and go home right now, right? Work hard and mind your own business. That's the only verse we need today. And the fact is, you know, really, we all know we should mind our business individually and we should mind our own business corporately and nationally. But God, clearly, based on those verses, is a libertarian, right? Have I offended everyone? I mean, have I left anybody out yet? Just let me know. I can continue. But the point is, when it comes to putting our faith before our politics, it's really not enough to say, well, the Bible first and politics second. That's not enough. It doesn't work. But no matter where you stand politically, you can pick a verse and you can take it out of context and you can use it to your advantage and you can support your stand. And, and this second one may even surprise you even more. This second one says, well, you know, we can't even put... Jesus first. It says people first, but we can't put Jesus first and politics second. Because no matter where you stand, you can find something Jesus said that supports where you stand. And the interesting thing is this. When it comes to this type of political season, we all want Jesus on our side, don't we? Especially if we're Christians. But when you read the gospel, when you read the gospel, you find out Jesus didn't come to take anybody's side. He didn't come to be on the left. He didn't come to be on the right. He didn't come to be on anybody's side. Jesus came to take over, right? And yet for some reason, when it comes to this type of political season, we're all trying to reel Jesus in to support our views. I, I don't know if you uh, remember the story of Abraham Lincoln or but Abraham Lincoln, during the midst of the Civil War, uh, one of his top aides came in and sat down and he said, uh, Mr. Lincoln, do you think God is on our side? And Lincoln looked at the man and said, it does not matter whether God is on my side or on our side or not. What matters is that I on God's side. Amen. Okay? So, simply trying to find something that Jesus said to support what you believe politically isn't enough, and simply putting Jesus before politics isn't enough. For us to get this right, and I believe that we can get this right, in fact, I'm sure we can get this right, for us to get this right, for us to get this right, we have this opportunity that we cannot miss. We have an opportunity right now, especially in the next couple of days. We have an opportunity in the next three days to get this right, and that requires more than just reading what the Bible says. It even requires more than reading what Jesus said. To get this right requires that we actually approach this topic the same way Jesus approached everything, right? In other words, to get this right, we actually have to do something that Jesus did. And Jesus did one thing specifically, and Jesus did one thing intentionally, that models, that shows us, that, that tells us the way for all of us. And all of us can do this, and it's complicated. I mean, it's so simple, you don't even have to write it down. But it's so committed, it's so transformative. The way you keep your faith in front of your politics, the way you keep your faith built the first is you put people first <laughs> and politics second. People first and politics because Jesus, Jesus was always for what was best for people, right? So you put people first and your politics second. And when you start getting in a disagreement, when things start to get heated over politics, you're putting politics before people.
people. I mean, if you've been coming to church for a while, this is one of the first lessons that you learn when you started coming to church. Jesus always put what was best for people first. And that's our common ground. That's our common ground as citizens. That's our common ground, certainly as Christians. And that's our common ground for our Heavenly Father. So to kind of tease this out of it, we could say something like this. <laughs> no, there should be another one in there. It says, it says that we can disagree. We can. <laughs> Technical problems today. I didn't do it. No. I know. I don't, I don't, I just, I, sometimes it drives me crazy that this works so perfect in practice and then when we get up here it doesn't always work, but it, it does. We can disagree, okay, we, let, let me just, you know, church happened for thousands of years before we had power. We can disagree and we should and we could and we will disagree. We can disagree what's best for a people. We can disagree what's best for the people. But we cannot and we dare not disagree on what's best for a people. It's actually what's best for a person. We can disagree about what's best for the people. I mean, you can name any bill, name anything before Congress right now, name any of these things we're debating as a nation, and we can debate about which side, which version is best for the people, but we cannot debate whether or not what's best for the people is best for a particular person. Now when you read the Gospel, this becomes so clear. If there's a theme all throughout the Gospel, it's this. Jesus is for what's best for people. Jesus is best all for what is best for people both corporately and individually. But Jesus, when he was talking to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, looked at what was best for a person. And when he spoke corporately, he spoke what was best for the person. When he spoke to all of Israel and gave the Sermon on the Mount, he spoke corporately. But when he talked to the woman at the well, he talked to a person. And what he said in one sense was different than what he said in another sense. They were congruent, but they were different. And if you know the Gospels, you know the Gospels, the one thing that drove Jesus crazy, the one thing that upset him the most, would be when religious people would use religious laws to actually hurt people. When the religious people would take religious law and hurt people, it made Jesus crazy. The people who made Jesus the most upset were the religious people, not the sinners. The people who used religion to make their point. And in the process, in the process of making their point, they didn't do what was best for people. Jesus was saying over and over and over again, you got this all wrong. You got it backwards, as a matter of fact. God didn't create people for the law. God created the law for the people. God didn't create the law for the people. He created, or did God created the law for the people. He didn't create the law for him. God didn't create people to be religious. He didn't create religion for, the people, for, for himself. He created religion for the people. So one day, there's this group of people, and they come to Jesus. And if you grew up in church, or you've been coming here to Odyssey, we speak about this often. You're listening online. You, you've heard it. You're so familiar with it. You, you're so familiar with this verse, you can probably just finish it for me from memory. This group of people they come to Jesus, and they say, Jesus, and this is sort of my version of it. Jesus comes with this question. He says, Jesus, you know, you're, you're, you're this great teacher. You claim to be so close to God. In fact, we heard you tell us specifically, Jesus, what's most important to you. Now, it doesn't mean that other things aren't important. There's a lot in the Bible that's very important. But he, they're just saying, you know, what is it that's most important? You know, at that time, there were so many laws, there were so many rules, there was so much that, that they couldn't even comprehend it. So they're trying to narrow it down. I say, what is the most important thing? 
Now you have to remember that Jesus is talking to a crowd that is full of religious people. They were all believers, not in Jesus, but in, in God. They all had a theology. So you remember what he said? He said this. The most important commandment is this. And then he says, listen. And, and it's of my opinion, when Jesus says, listen, we should stop whatever we're doing and listen, because he's Jesus, he's God. It's listen. The Lord your God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind all your soul and all your strength. But before they could even breathe, before they could even breathe, Jesus said, calm boy. I mean, it would be great if Jesus just stopped here. But Jesus is just this great teacher. He's such a, a, a fantastic teacher that he just keeps on running. But see, see, the thing is, if Jesus just stopped right here, this is all internal. There's a lot of wiggle room in this right now because nobody can really see if you're loving the Lord with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength and all your soul. Nobody can really see that. In fact, I would bet you that if you were to ask any one of the political candidates right now that are running for office, even those that are running for the highest office, do you believe in God? What's their answer going to be? Yes. They all claim to be Christians, right? The answer is always yes. Who's going to say no? I mean, you'd have to be agnostic, or you'd have to be an atheist to say no. And even if you were, your political aspirations would still make you say yes. I mean, not that politicians would ever lie, but they might. <laughs> in fact, all over the world, in fact, all over the world, people would say yes if you were to ask them, do you believe in God? They'd say, sure, I love God. Do you love God with all your heart? Well, I don't know if I love it with all my heart, but I, I do the very best I can. Do you love God with all your soul? Well, I'm not sure what that even means. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if I know what that means, but yeah, I guess so. Do you love him with all your mind? Well, I don't know what that means. You know, but I, I try. You know, I guess so. I mean, I think so. I mean, who can argue with somebody whether they love God with all their heart or all their soul and all their strength? All their soul? I mean, it's internal. We don't know. There's so much wiggle room there. There's really no way to tell if they're really loving God. See, you can do a lot of things under this big umbrella of loving God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your mind. You can do a lot of things. So Jesus, he doesn't even pause. He just keeps on going. The next word about his mouth is this. He says, the second is equally important. He said, I'm not finished with you yet. Hold your questions until later. The most important thing is to love God with everything in you. And the second is like it. The second is equivalent. The, so the second is on the same level. The second is just as important as the first. Remember what he said? Yeah. In fact, if you're not a church person or you're not a Christian, you've probably heard this before. You may have even said this before, but this may be the first time that you've heard that Jesus said it first. What he said was this. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than this. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, he records one other sentence that Jesus said. He says it like this. A second is equally important. <coughs> Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophet are based on these two commandments. And that crowd that day, you know, sort of, sort of like I did. Maybe some of you are going to cry. I said, man, couldn't, couldn't Jesus just stop? With love God? Couldn't he just stop there? Because I can love God on the inside and I can do whatever I want on the outside. In fact, you know, I can treat my neighbor the way my neighbor treats me if all I have to do is love God on the inside. And I would love to treat my neighbor the way my neighbor treats me. You know, I can go tit for tat with anybody if I just have to love God on the inside and don't have to do anything on the outside. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Let me tell you what's important to me. Let me tell you what's important to my Heavenly Father. What's most important to me is that you love God with everything in you and that you demonstrate how much you love God by how you treat others. You demonstrate your love for God on the inside by how you treat others on the outside. 
And the way we demonstrate our love for God in this side is by how well we treat people on the outside. And there is no wiggle room in that. You demonstrate your love for God. You demonstrate how much you love Him with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength by the way you treat other people. Because what's most important to God, what's most important to Jesus, is not politics, but people. What's most important to God is the children, the ones that He created. And we can debate what's best for the people, but we dare not as Christians debate whether or not what's best for all people is what's best for a person. And again, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew records it that way. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Go back, Rob. I'm sorry. Love your neighbor as yourself because the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments alone. And see, in, in, in us, in, in our modern world, we can't even begin to understand how emotional, how charged up, how amped up the people in that crowd got that day. Because there was over 600 laws in, in, in the first century. 600 plus laws and all the law. And not just the law, but everything the prophets said. Everything that they knew from all the scriptures, from Moses all the way to Malachi. They, 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 they said it all hinges on this one thing. And I don't know whether you've ever tried to read the prophets or not. I mean, it's like the same thing over and over and over and over again. You messed up. You're going to be punished if you don't repent. And you don't repent. God punishes you. And you finally say, well, God was really serious about that repentance thing. So you say you're sorry and you repent and God loves you so much He forgives you and you get back to the lifestyle you enjoy and then you mess up again and we repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. And this is Jesus saying. He said, everything that has been said by you, Everything that's been spoken by, everything that's written by God and His prophets, it all comes down to this. That is, it all hinges. That is, all, it's all contingent upon. It's all about these two single commandments. This is Jesus Christ saying, if you forget everything else, if you never have an opportunity to read a Bible again, if you don't do anything else in your Christian life, if you just do these two things, you have fulfilled, you have done everything that is in God's Word. The way you treat people made in the image of God and created by God is a reflection of your true love for God. What's most important to God so what should be most important to us is simply people. And here's the thing. If you want to keep your faith in front of your politics, you have to put people ahead of your politics. So we can disagree and we will disagree on our politics. That's human nature. And we can disagree on what's best for our neighbors. And we can disagree on what's best for everybody in the United States, but we dare not forget that what's best for everybody, what's best for all our neighbors is not always best for everybody. And I mean, when we think about it, that is so simple. We all know it to be true. But think about this. You know, you all are intelligent people. I know that. Imagine. I want you to just try to imagine. I want you to, I want, I want you to think really, really big. Okay? Th think about this. You know, use your mind's eye. Use your imagination. But imagine if every single person in the United States, Christian or not, just loved their neighbors as themselves, what would happen in the next three years? I mean, it's not just the Christian faith that says this. Almost every religion teaches us that we should treat people properly. That we should treat people with love. But what if, just imagine, if every single person in the United States decided between now and Tuesday, if everybody in America said, I am going to be consistent and purposely and intentional about loving my neighbor as myself, I'm going to do for others what I wish they would do for me, even if they don't do it for me. You think that if every single person in America would do that between now and the election on Tuesday, that our nation would begin to feel different? I mean, most of our laws would be absolutely pointless. So we could keep them on the books, but they'd never be tested. Our country would be completely different before long. And it wouldn't matter. Here's the thing. 
It wouldn't matter who the president was because what would happen in our country would be so powerful, it didn't matter who the leaders in charge were. Because if we were all loving each other as God has told us to do, whatever law they passed, whatever thing they said to do, we'd already be doing it. Because it all hinges. And you know this. It all hinges. We all know Jesus was right. Everything hinges on the love for God on the inside and how we treat our neighbors on the outside. I mean, this would be a game changer. That's why this is so simple. It's so simplistic. But yet, at the same time, it's so very, very difficult to think in terms of placing that value, our faith value, our Christian values, ahead of our political values, because our political values and our political ideals are so emotional. We believe them so strongly. Now, sort of switching gears a little bit, and we're going to come back to that next week. Here's a... Here's something to keep in mind, because this is challenging, and you're probably sitting there, you know, I, I know Ron's probably right. I know Jesus is right. But come on, man, you just took all the fun out of it. I know they're right, but I sort of like them conversations. So here's something I just want you to think about as you think about how this would look in your own personal life. How does this look in your life? Here's something to think about your behavior. You already know this. Your behavior makes perfect sense to you, doesn't it? How you act makes perfect sense to you, or you wouldn't do it. I mean, if somebody came to you and said, why did you do that? Why did you vote for that person? What did you do? You'd say, I had no idea. Of course you wouldn't say that. Because your behavior makes perfect sense to you. You know why it does I mean, like with me, I don't always know why my kids' behavior makes perfect sense to them, but I know why my behavior makes perfect sense to me. Everybody's behavior makes perfect sense to them. Every single person you've ever met, every single person you've ever seen, everybody's behavior makes perfect sense to him or her. I mean... I mean, this includes your political views, doesn't it? Your political views make sense to you. Your political will make sense to you. And if I would say, you know, why would you vote for that person? You know? I'd never vote. Why, why would you vote for that person? Why would you support that view? I mean, I can't believe that. You support that? You're supposed to be a Christian. Why would you actually go out and protest against that? Why would you be all up in arms over that? Why would you send everybody that article that you know on Facebook and email? Why would you do that? Why would you put that down? I mean, how can those political views make sense to you? And the fact is, everybody's political views make sense to him or her, don't they? So here's the lesson. Here's the lesson. This is so important. If you consider yourself to be a Christian, you know, this is the point to pay attention. When you don't know how somebody could do such a thing, when you don't know how somebody could believe such a thing, when you don't know how you know somebody could support such a bill, such an action, such a person, how, how do you know? How, when you don't know how somebody could support that particular view or support that bill, when you don't know how in the world they could do such a thing, support such a thing, believe such a thing, here's the reason. It's because there is something you do not know. It's because there's something you do not know. When you run into, when you hear about, when you talk to somebody who holds a view, and you're like, how in the world could that person believe such a thing? How could they support such a thing? The problem is, there is something you do not know. So one of the best things you can do during this political season, one of the best things you can do to help your faith and keep it in front of your politics is when you find yourself in one of these emotionally charged conversations, maybe even one of these heated conversations, or you overhear somebody and you're starting to get an attitude and you're tempted to quit minding your own business and go over there and put your two cents worth in, or you're beginning to lose respect for somebody, here's what I want to encourage you to do. Be a student. Be a student. Not a critic. Amen. Because everybody can learn something. Because if you're a student and not a critic, you'll end up learning something. 
You'll learn something about them. You might even learn something about yourself. And here's the thing, and I am, please, don't take this the wrong way. I'm not trying to insult you, okay? But if you don't think you need to learn something, you're either one arrogant or you're insecure or you're both. That's true. Mm -hmm. Or you're God. Mm -hmm. And if you're God, I'm going to ask you to do something. Will you do to our offering this morning what God did to the loaves and the fishes, okay? Amen. <laughs> Will you let us have seven basketfuls left over after everybody's had their, <laughs> had their fill? But I don't think you're God. So if there's something in you that gets all worked up, if there's something in you that gets all worked up, especially over political issues, especially at this election time, if you get so worked up and you can't learn anything, Please don't take this the wrong way, but that is a you problem, not a political problem. That's a you problem, not a political problem. And you know what we can do? We can do something, and we have an opportunity to do it, that maybe we've never had before. We can take this political season, we can take this election and use it for good. We can use it to learn, and the way you learn something is beside is deciding your mind, to make up your mind, to be intentional about it that I am going to be a student first and I'll be a critic second. Now for some of you, that comes very easy. But if you're like me, I just need to put this on every mirror in my house. I need to put it on the dashboard of every car I drive. I need to tattoo it on my arm because it doesn't come natural to me. And I can't speak for all of you in here, but you know I have these beliefs and they're so ingrained in me that I just go there so quickly. Because I get so worked up over what makes sense to me, especially in this political season. I, I look at some people view and I'm thinking, how can you even believe that? But here's the deal. If you're a Christian, if you're a Jesus follower, you should be the most, as Christians, as Jesus follower, we should be the most confident, the most curious, the most composed, the most compassionate people in any room. Amen, amen, amen. And we should never, ever be arrogant or abrasive over politics, ever. Amen. Because here's the thing, if you believe your eternity is all worked out, if you believe that God knows you by name, that should give you confidence. You should be the most confident of all people. Amen. If you believe you're a son or daughter of the living God, if you believe that God is your heavenly Father and your salvation, your salvation is all worked out, it doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter what you do for a living, it doesn't matter how many belongings you have, there should be a confidence that comes with that. But not only should you be the most confident, you should be the most curious of all people. As Christians, we should be the most curious people on this entire planet. We should be the learners above all learners. Because we believe that our God has infinite wisdom. Yes. When does infinite wisdom run out? Never. It never runs out. Exactly. That means between now and the time you take your last breath here on earth, you are just got a little teeny bit of understanding of the wisdom of God. And as Christians, we should be so intensely curious so eternally curious, and we should never, ever, ever be threatened by science. Anytime science rolls out something new, anytime science discovers something new, anytime science changes its mind, Christians just go, oh, that's the way God did that. So that's how He designed it. So that's how He created it. We should never be threatened by science. We should be the most curious of all people. We should be the learners of the learners. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't have an opinion. We should have an opinion. And it doesn't even mean that we shouldn't argue our opinion. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have a view. It doesn't mean we don't believe in our view and that we don't believe in it even passionately. But in terms of our response,